the first and greatest commandment. How can I love God with all my heart? Uh, Jane Austen, perhaps the most renowned romance novelist, she said, happiness in marriage is entirely a matter of chance. So I guess love is just a roll of the dice. Maybe you luck out, maybe not. But, I mean, does it, doesn't love overcome all things? I mean, that, that is what 1 Corinthians says. That's what romance stories all say. Ah, love overcomes all things. I mean, that's what all the wall decorations at Hobby Lobby say. So how can I love God with all my heart? The book of Acts, it's a small history book concerning the first generation church movement. In chapter 11, it zooms in on one particular church here in a place called Antioch. And in fact, this church was so vibrant, they were so passionate about the Lord Jesus Christ that the Bible says it was here in this congregation that believers and disciples were first called, not calling themselves, but they were first called Christians. I would say it's safe to assume those people loved Jesus. Boy, they loved Christ with all their heart, so much so the community said, these people are Christians. Antioch at a church with a heart for God. As we look at these few verses here in this one single paragraph, I think there's a few key factors that I would like to observe in understanding how a church might come to love God with all of our hearts. In fact, we kind of see this unfold in the life of one particular Christian, one of their leaders named Barnabas. There are four indicators this morning of the heart love that Barnabas had for God. I want to talk today on this matter of having a heart love for God and the indicators of that heart love. And as we continue in the next few weeks, we'll see what it means to have a soul love and a mind love and a strength love for the Lord. But this heart love here in this church and in this man Barnabas resulted in passionate Christian faith and it led to them pursuing gospel missions. I want you to notice, first of all, that a heart love for God is formed by intentional awareness. It doesn't happen on accident. You're not just going to be scrolling through Facebook and somebody puts their Christian meme on there and suddenly you'll be deeply passionate about the Lord Jesus Christ. It takes intentional awareness. In this particular passage, you'll notice with me, uh, beginning here in verse 22 of Acts chapter 11, we can see how the church in Jerusalem became aware of the need in Antioch. They heard about the need. Verse 22, then tidings or news. The news of these things came unto the ears of the church, which is in Jerusalem. So the church there in Jerusalem heard about the need. We can then notice that Barnabas saw the grace of God. Look at verse number 23. Who, when Barnabas came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad. Aha! So his heart was being stirred up because he saw grace. The church at Jerusalem heard of the need. Verse 26 says that he found Paul. He was diligently seeking this guy, Saul of Tarsus, Paul the Apostle, and he recruited him. So he found him, and then it says that he, uh, Barnabas and Paul, they went about teaching the people. You understand the intentionality that's here? It wasn't like they were just casually attending the gathering on Sunday mornings. It wasn't like it was this nominal Christianity of just the Jesus fish on their bumper. This was intentional awareness. They were looking, they were listening, they were seeking, they were teaching. So this heart love that I'm going to have for God, it's going to require a great deal of effort. This ministry was intentional. You know, it was Jeremiah in the Old Testament in Lamentations 3. He said, my eye affects my heart. See, when you and I look to the need, as Jesus looked on the masses, our hearts will be moved with compassion. It's necessary for us to keep the mission in full view. The devil will do nothing but distract you this week from your mission. He can't have a a Christian soul in hell. He can't have you condemned, but he can have you distracted. It is so imperative that we keep the mission in full view. 
Just a, a couple of weeks ago, missionary Isaac Torres told us, so many of us heard about the adversity against the gospel in China. It was mind-blowing. It was, as we say, eye-opening to hear him and his account. Sean Tice was recently with us, and he just brought us the need of the fatherless in our community. Last November, many of us attended the CareNet banquet, and we had our hearts stirred for the unborn. Uh, and, and even right now, you can read the missionary report uh, from Jimmy Pack and maybe some of the other missionaries out on the table. Friends, it's so imperative that we continually have these people speak into our lives, remind us of the mission at hand and the needs that are all around us. And when you intentionally get yourself involved, when you intentionally look, and when you listen, and when you pursue and seek, your heart will be stirred. You can't help but, but note uh, the, the human trafficking problem in our nation. You can't help but notice the drug problem in our community. You can't help but see the families bickering and fighting and falling apart in our own community and not realize there's a great uh, need before us. When you intentionally look, your heart will be stirred. If you look at the gospel of Jesus Christ, as we sang about this morning, to know you, Lord, when you look at his gospel, When you spend time in the word, and then when you look at the guy who cuts you off in traffic, you will recognize that his road rage really is just an expression of him needing the love of God. When my eyes are open to the mission before us, it's going to stir up my heart appropriately. This week, President Trump assigned money and a task force to battling human trafficking. And I began to read the articles about this sickening evil of sex slavery, about children who are stolen, abused, and destroyed. And then when I consider how very little I can do about it in my own power, I just begged God to use me somehow, somehow touch this church with with the power of God so that he might shine the light of the gospel into this broken world. So we might reach someone somehow. When the need is before your eyes, you'll unplug from those silly distractions and we will get connected to the true gospel ministry. When we see what's going on, when we hear of the needs in the other places and when we see of those that are seeking after God, when we see those that are broken and falling apart, when we look to the gospel and the Savior, Jesus Christ, when we can find that he is all-powerful and we are no-powerful, when we can recognize those things, then we will fall freshly in love with the Lord. Then we'll call out for him in a fresh need. A heart love for God is formed by intentional awareness. Oh, you've heard it so many times before. Don't bury your head in the sand, right? We have to be intentionally aware, not just about what uh, the news wants us to be aware of. Be aware of what Jesus wants you to be aware of. We also would see in verse 22 that a heart love for God results in a missionary program. It is formed by our awareness, but it results in missions work. Look at verse number 22. The tidings of these things came to the ears of the church, which was in Jerusalem. And so they changed their profile picture and said, prayers for Antioch, love and good vibes coming your way. No, 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 no. When they heard, they sent. Get it? They heard of the need, and it says, and they sent Fourth, Barnabas, that he should go as far as Antioch. Look, if Barnabas is a church member here in Vero Beach, he's like the guy you don't want to leave. You you want him to be here. You're like, teach us, Barnabas. Love us, Barnabas. Comfort us, Barnabas. He was a man of God, full of faith, full of the Holy Spirit. This guy back in the book of Acts sold his land, gave all the money to the church, always caring for people, so much so they changed his name. They said, we're going to call you the son of comfort. You're the most comforting person we know. I mean, the description on his life is the same name Christ gave the Holy Spirit, the comforter. This is the guy in the church you would not want to leave. And they said, we have to send Barnabas to Antioch. Because they were touched with this awareness, they, the result was a missionary program. Look, as much as any church would love to keep all the members, you know, forever and ever, nobody leaves. We must remember that the plan is actually to spread all over the world. In my office, I have a stack of connection cards, probably that thick. 
I'm not exaggerating when I say it's, it's hundreds of people who have come through our doors. Uh, some have stayed for any period of time. Some have left. Some of you are still here, amazingly. And, and I, I could look at that, and I could think, you know, hey, why aren't we keeping everyone? We could look at that, and we could think, like, this is a great big failure. I mean, the stack's this big, and the church isn't that big. I mean, what's going on? What are we doing wrong? Or we could look at it and we can say, you know what, we've been faithfully feeding the word of God to anyone who will listen. And, and so many of them have taken the word and now they're over in Texas and now they're over in Georgia and now they're over in some other church and now they're, they've taken it with them. And as long as we stay faithful, friends, we have got to be content with like the sending power of the gospel, not the keeping uh, power of, of the comfort zone. The church's job is not to keep everyone forever and ever. Man, I would want Barnabas to stay. You know what I'm saying? Barnabas was trained, he was discipled, he was brought to Jesus Christ in Jerusalem. I mean, probably it was Peter and James pouring into that guy's life, raising him up as a disciple. Then they had to let him go. And then they had to start all over with somebody else, training them up in the admonition of the Lord. Man, I can only imagine how Peter and James must have felt losing their best man. But you know, God knows. And a New Testament church isn't designed to keep, it's designed to send. We must occupy ourselves with getting the gospel to the world. And that might mean funding missionaries. And it might mean becoming missionaries. In the coming weeks, we're going to host several missionary families, like we recently did the Torres uh, to China. And I want to encourage you, even now, to, to be on your knees daily asking that God would use you for his worldwide mission. Pray something like, like, Father, I desire to love you with all my heart, and I know that your heart is to reach the world with the gospel. Lord, how can I be used? What can I give? Where can I go? Whom can I send? This has got to be the prayer of a New Testament Christian. If we're not praying these things, well, you have not because you ask not. And if we're not praying these things, friend, the mission dies. The mission goes elsewhere. But I desire to be a part of the Great Commission of Jesus Christ. We have to be in prayer over this thing. You know, the explorer and medical missionary, Dr. David Livingston, he said on his deathbed, you can bury my body in England, but bury my heart in Africa. Christians who make a difference are the ones who have given their heart to God. And I wonder today who would surrender their heart to Jesus Christ. I wonder who would be that one that would say, Lord, I desire to love you with all my heart. And if you've called me to Vero Beach, Lord, bury my heart in Vero Beach. Lord, if you've called me to the foreign mission field, bury my heart there. And wherever God buries your heart, guarantee he's going to bury your strength. He's going to bury your mind. He's going to put you all there. Verse 20 is the first time that that the church took its mission out of Jerusalem and into the Gentile world. Aside from Philip all alone going to the Samaritans, this is it. This is the first time the church in Jerusalem created their missions program. In verse 20, some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. That's That's the beginning of of the world mission movement. And since then, the word of God was being preached. And friends, when the word of God is preached according to the will of God, it will be empowered by the spirit of God. That's exactly what happened. See, you can be a missionary right here in Vero. You ought to be. Friends, you can carry your Bible into work tomorrow. Not every Christian on earth has that privilege. But you can. You can take a gift and a gospel tract to your neighbor. You can minister to their pains and to their needs. You can pastor your street this week. You could evangelize at a nursing home or at a jail or at a children's home. I mean, you could partner with local ministries like CareNet. You could partner with ministries like God is my dad. Check this out. This is what is so encouraging about verse 20. Some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene. That's like the the border between uh, Jerusalem and, and northern Africa. The first converts in Antioch, the first missionary movement, was not some great, big, miraculous, powerful thing like the day of Pentecost. 
It wasn't even by the authority of the apostles. It wasn't by Jesus Christ himself. Rather, it was because there, are, there were just a few ordinary Christians who had a heart for God. And they shared the gospel where Christ had led them. I mean, somehow these guys had made it from northern Africa into Jerusalem. And there in Jerusalem, when they looked around and they saw that this city was already rich with the gospel, they looked on and heard about those in Antioch who did not know Jesus Christ. And those men gave it all up, packed it all up, and they headed north. They were taking the gospel to this place, which would become one of the most pivotal and powerful churches of their day. A few ordinary Christians with the power of God. When the word got back to Jerusalem about the new converts in, in Antioch, they had heard people are being converted, they're coming to Christ, they're what we call babes in Christ, and they need training, they need, they need nurtured and discipled. The elders there in Jerusalem decided to send Barnabas. Who's the best guy that could train these new Christians? We have to send Barnabas. The Lord wants us to send Barnabas. And I don't think anyone in the New Testament really models the compassionate heart of Jesus Christ like the man Barnabas did. And Mark 9 shows us the heart of Jesus. You could go to Mark 9 and find that the heart of Christ is meant to be the heart of the believers. See, the Bible says, but when Jesus saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion. Because they fainted, they were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. You understand what what happened there in Mark 9 with Jesus Christ is exactly what happened years later uh, in, in Jerusalem. Jesus saw the masses. He had intentional awareness. He was moved with compassion And so he was sending forth laborers. Shortly thereafter, he would send out 70 witnesses, 70 evangelists. Now you come to Acts 11, and those same evangelists, those same apostles, they begin to uh, repeat and to duplicate Christ's ministry. They were aware. They were moved with compassion, and they sent their man, Barnabas. Jesus looks at all people with compassion. You know, he doesn't love Americans any more than he loves the Syrians. And Barnabas learned to do the same thing. He learned to get outside of his Jewish comfort zone and go to the Gentile world. When those Gentiles needed a pastor, Barnabas was there. Having a heart for God results in a missions program. Last week, I had shared a story of a missionary family in Cambodia And you might remember, you know, they witnessed this family coming to their church who were being beaten by their dad for attending church. And I need to apologize for leaving you guys hanging on that story. I had several people like, what happened? (laughs) Did they get help? Yeah, the, the church was able to document the abuse and to report him, the dad, uh, to authorities. So the family's safe. But get this, guys. Not only are they safe from an abusive man, but because there were some Westerners with a heart for God and a heart for the gospel who went over into Cambodia to learn the language and to learn the culture, they were also safe from the penalty of hell. Not only were they rescued from this abusive father, they were rescued from sin because somebody had a heart for God. A heart for God does result in a heart for others, uh, which is the second commandment, right? That's exactly what Jesus said. Jesus said unto him, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy, uh, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it, love thy neighbor as thyself. Having that heart for God results in loving my neighbor. In other words... A heart for God results in a missionary effort. Either we must, as New Testament Christians, as followers of Jesus, send, go, or spend. Either we must be praying, God, would you raise up my children and take them to the mission field with the gospel? God, would you raise me up and send me to the mission field? Or God, would you turn loose of the money that's in my bank account so that I might send it to the mission field? We have to either go or send or spend. 
we have to be involved in the work of missions. But this is not something that, that you have to, you know, uh, be a part of dutifully. You don't have to drag yourself into the missions program. You, don't have, you know, God's not going to pry the money out of your hand. But when you develop a heart for God, it results in a missions effort. Perhaps you would pray if God would have you to sponsor a missionary family. Perhaps you would even hear the call of God to leave your home and go. When you love God with all your heart, you know, none of those things would ever seem like a sacrifice. They would be given up just like second nature. See, when the parent gives to their child or when the husband gives to his wife and when they do so from an overflowing love, they don't consider it a sacrifice. You moms stay up all night with the babies. And you dads do things. And we don't consider that a sacrifice by the overflowing love. See, when you love God, you'll find that the transformative work of the Holy Spirit, what the Bible calls the fruit of the Spirit, would be overflowing with goodness. Goodness. A heart love for God results in a missionary effort. Thirdly, a heart love for God encourages others to be near to God. When you're in love with Jesus, it's going to encourage other believers to be in love with Jesus. Verse number 23. So this is Barnabas. It says, who when he came and had seen the grace of God was glad and exhorted them all. He comforted, he encouraged them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Ghost and of faith, and much people had been added unto the Lord. Barnabas exhorted them. You know what? In other words, the son of comfort comforted them. He got there. He saw the grace of God. He saw these people that used to be pagans. He saw these people that used to be messed up in all kinds of worldly, carnal sin. He had seen those that had been converted and brought to belief in Jesus Christ. He saw all these babes, and he saw the grace of God. He was glad, and then he challenged them. He exhorted them. He lifted them up, and he said, you have to cleave to the Lord with all your heart. You have to purpose in your heart to cling to Jesus. Exhortation is one of the main ways the Bible wants a Christian to communicate. I mean, there's plenty of angry pulpit pounders that love statements in the Bible like we're supposed to rebuke. But so often the Bible tells us to exhort. Over and over, all throughout the New Testament, we find people seeking Jesus for his exhortation, for his comforting words. You know why? Because everyone wants comfort. Everyone wants exhorted today. Everyone that you come in contact with wants you to just lift them up a little bit. And you can lift them up by bringing them to God. Uh, Barnabas went about exhorting the church in Antioch. It's the same word that was used of uh, Jesus uh, in Jesus' most famous sermon. You know, he said uh, on the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. That's the promise of Jesus Christ. Barnabas took that promise into Antioch. Those people, broken, sinners, wicked, uh, horrible past, probably losing family members, losing friends over their newfound faith. And here comes Barnabas who said, you can be comforted in Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 14 now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. When someone's heart has received the comfort of Jesus, you know what? They comfort others. When someone's heart really is full of God, when you have a heart love for Jesus, you will become an exhorter. I know it is a fact today that you have been hurt. And I know it is a fact today that God has comforted you. Those facts right there make you a perfect vessel that he can use to comfort others. 
the reason that you've been hurt, the reason that you've been uh, betrayed, the reason that you have suffered, but he has comforted you, makes you the perfect preacher to comfort others. This is the defining work of the ministry. And it's a powerful theme all throughout the Bible, particularly Psalms. You know, the way that God comforts us in our sorrow, it's our greatest testimony of his grace. The way that God comforts you is your greatest testimony of grace. Psalm 71. Thou shalt increase my greatness and comfort me on every side. I am as a wonder to many, but thou art my strong refuge. Because God can comfort this broken man, others stand and they wonder at him. When you're laid up in the hospital and it looks pretty bleak, when the family members run off, when, the, when everything's in torments, when you've lost the job, when you've been stabbed in the back, when, when life is life, and when God comforts you, everyone else looks on in, in wonder. And so your comfort from the Lord Jesus, your refuge in the Lord, friends, is your testimony. Verse 23, it shows us this spectacular pattern, right? Like it says he comes there, he sees the grace of God, his heart is moved and he's glad, and then he exhorts them, he gives them these words of comfort, he's giving them this sermon, and the the root of the sermon is you have to have a purposed heart. You have to make the commitment now, today. You have to get that purpose that you will be committed unto the Lord Jesus. I wonder if maybe he used the book of Daniel, you know, that testimony of Daniel in chapter one, it says, Daniel purposed in his heart not to defile himself. I wonder if maybe uh, uh, Barnabas said, take your Bibles and open up with me today to Daniel chapter 1. I'd probably be like, unroll your scrolls to Daniel, you know. Daniel purposed in his heart to stay near to God. Barnabas said, church in Antioch, purpose in your heart. And Barnabas says to the church in Vero Beach, the same thing. Have a purpose. Have have a heart. And, you know, having a heart for God, it's going to exhort others to draw near to Jesus. Uh, Every person on your street has a burden. Each person at your job place is in a storm. And what they need most of all is someone to share with them the good news about the storm. About the one who is over the storm. So Robert Louis Stevenson told a story about this ship, a vessel that was off of a rocky coast. And there was a storm threatening to destroy the ship. And in the midst of the terror, there was just this one daring passenger who decided to head up to the deck to see how things fared. He made the dangerous passage on this rocking boat up to the pilot house. And he saw the helmsman there at the post holding the wheel unwaveringly turning that ship just inch by inch out to sea. The pilot saw the watcher, and he smiled. That daring passenger, he went below, he made it back to the, to the crowd, and he gave them this note of cheer. He says, I have seen the face of the pilot, and he smiled. All is well. If you're in a storm, friends, look to the face of the pilot. And friends, if you've gone through the storm and if you've seen his smile, share that with others. Develop a heart for God and it results in exhortation. Fourthly, and finally, let's note in verse 25 that a heart love for God is passionate about the scriptures. Verse 25. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. Now at this point, the apostle Paul was a new believer. He had been a terror to the church, and so at this point, Christians did not believe that this guy was a believer. Barnabas gave him the benefit of the doubt. Barnabas went to Tarsus to seek Saul, and when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch, and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. 
So what we've seen from Barnabas is that he had been radically transformed by Jesus. All the way back in chapter 4, we had seen this man, Barnabas. Uh, Originally, his name was Joseph. He had come to Christ. He began giving away and just comforting everybody he could. This man, I mean, as far as the spiritual gifts go, it was the spiritual gift of mercy. He was a giver. He was involved in people's life like that. And in chapter 11, he just up and relocates. He's out here. I mean, I guess he'd already sold his house. Big deal, right? So he just up and relocates to Antioch. And it was in that place that he began to knit his heart with a new church of people he had never known. These were believers. These weren't even Jews. He's in the Grecian world. He's walking into a strange church, and he's giving to them out of the same heart he gave back to his brothers and sisters back in Jerusalem. He knits his heart with them, and then, while he's there, he gets it in his mind that, you know, Saul of Tarsus could use a friend. And this man who had been ministering has a new church home, has a new church family, has a new love there in Antioch. He thinks, hmm, I'm going to head over to Tarsus. I'm going to find that guy. I'm going to bring him to Jesus Christ. He needs a friend. He needs a mentor. And this all happened not because Barnabas was extraordinary, but because he was consumed by the things of God. You know, he had recognized his citizenship in heaven. He had given his heart over to the Lord Jesus. Uh, The earthly things didn't matter so much anymore, so he could make the journey. He could go and retrieve the guy. And Barnabas was an example of what it's like to live for Jesus. And the only way of doing that in this life, the only way that I can ever live for heaven is if I live in the word. And I will tell you one thing, friends. Uh, Because it is my task to continually bring the word of God to this church week in and week out, and because I prepare a couple of things a week, and because just, you know, I have to put myself into this thing, I tell you, there has been nothing in my life greater for my own personal sanctification. There's been nothing greater in my life for my personal growth than this church right here. Because of having to have this commitment to the word of God, there has been a growth within me. There's been a sanctification that God has done. Why? Because of this book. Because of this Bible right here. These guys had a commitment to the word. Now check it out. Paul and Barnabas were like the dream team, man. I mean, nobody had a heart like Barnabas. Nobody had a mind like Paul. God chose these guys and used them in a great, great way. In one short year, in just one year, the Holy Spirit worked through them so much so that the church in Antioch, became so pivotal, the Gentiles started like mocking them, calling them Christians. Oh, you little Christs, you little Christ followers. They left a powerful imprint there in the Gentile world. Someone uh, recently asked if there's a a family in the Bible that like wasn't dysfunctional. (laughs) Great question, right? Uh, You can find a few godly couples in there. Um, You can find, uh, like, a godly mother in one case, maybe a godly child in another case. But I will say this. There has never been a family that doesn't need grace. There's never been a family. I mean, Jesus was brought into this world and given to Mary and to Joseph, and even that family needs the grace of Jesus Christ. Everyone needs grace, and it's for that reason right there that Barnabas brought Paul into Antioch. See, he he didn't bring him to the place like Jerusalem where the Jews just set about debating the scriptures day in and day out. He brought him into Antioch where people were starving for the scriptures, where the people had a heart that said, teach us, we'll sit, we'll listen, we'll hear, we'll obey. Everyone needs grace, and that's why Barnabas, Barnabas and Paul worked tirelessly for the Lord Jesus And Christ said, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Having a heart love for Jesus is going to result in you demonstrating that verse. When my heart is for the Lord, I will hunger and thirst for righteousness. A heart for God is passionate about the scripture. Psalm says, open wide thy mouth and I will. Psalm 119, 97, the psalmist says, Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. It's my love, the psalmist says, so I meditate. And you know what? Because I meditate, it's my love. 
Barnabas loved the word and exhorted the people to love it. So he brought to Antioch the greatest Bible teacher on the planet. Hey, church, I know y'all are hungry for the things of God. I'm headed out of town, and when I get back, I have a treat for you. I'm bringing you the finest Bible teacher you will ever hear. Barnabas loved the people, and he loved the word. And when you love both of those, you're all the time seeking to get those together. It's what the Bible calls the ministry of reconciliation. Get the word to the people. Get the people to the word. Get the people to God. Growing in the word is growing a heart for God. Loving God with all your heart, friends, it results in the missionary movement. When we have that intentional awareness. The missionary movement is defined as exhorting others to draw near to God, and that is done by being passionate about the Bible, which is how you develop a heart for God. Help us, dear Jesus, that we would truly love you. Change my heart, O God. I pray, Father, that uh, you would stir up a passion in here for world missions. I pray that as the missionaries come through our doors in the coming months, that they would be touched by a loving congregation. I pray that there'd be folks in here to, to hear your Holy Spirit. Lord, perhaps you would call someone to foreign missions. Perhaps you would call us to go or to send or to spend. I pray, Father, that we would have a, a full and uh, um, fervent commitment to the Bible, to the study of the word, that we would be under the preaching and teaching every available opportunity. I pray that we would make it a priority to love Jesus with all of our heart. Um, Lord, I ask all of this according to your uh, grace, and I pray that uh, your Holy Spirit would have the freedom to work your power in our midst. Lord, we ask for your gifts we ask for your power and for your filling and baptism. Lord, would you, uh, would you change us, make us more like Jesus Christ today for the glory of the Father, for the love of the Father. And in Jesus' almighty and precious name, I ask all of this. Amen.